the concept of a diamond, the best idea Philip Pullman admits of ever having, appears to be classically inspired. One clear origin is Socrates' diamond. Another is the old idea of the guardian angel, said the writer in an interview he gave after the subtle knife was published. If what Plato wrote is to be trusted as an authentic rendering of his mentor's ideas, Pullman's diamond having a material form and the ability to change into any conceivable animal does not particularly resemble Socrates' divine interior voice. The diamond's physical manifestation and morphing aptitude, present since infancy and retained until puberty, originated in the writer's literary imagination. Michael Shaban, a well-known American writer, in an insightful review of his dark materials said, the goddess of writers was smiling upon Philip Pullman on the day he came up with the idea for demons. From Pullman's point of view, it is also an intricate concept that plainly remains a work in progress. There are many blanks to be filled in its configuration. The last as yet untitled volume of the Book of Dust may bring clarification, but considering the wealth of unanswered questions, it is unlikely that all the doubts could be eliminated. The author may decide to develop the concept further and write a third trilogy, as it is hard to abandon a beautiful idea when its potential has not been fully explored. According to Pullman, diamonds settle when children complete their transition from innocence to experience, when they enter adulthood. Indeed, in Lyra's world, this crucial moment in child development is signaled to adolescents and to people among whom they live through this deceptively simple occurrence. In a world of invisible diamonds, the momentous transition is externally manifested only by physical signs of puberty, obvious, but less clear cut. The idea that diamonds reach at this point their permanent form is another reason why the concept resonates wonderfully with children who crave unequivocal direct guidance. The evidence gathered in what was already published in both trilogies at the time of writing shows that his dark materials provide a primary enchanting and marvelous side of the concept of diamond. The only evil and sinister manifestation of a spirit companion is Mrs. Coulter's monstrous monkey, Diamond Ozymandias. However, the wolf diamonds of the Tartar mercenaries guarding Bolvangar can also trigger nightmares as they are terrifying murderous creatures finding, fighting in tandem with their humans and reflecting the essence of these ruthless professional warriors. Pullman's treatment of Ozymandias is understandably harsh, in parallel to his unforgiving image of Mrs. Coulter, at least before her love for Lyra transformed her. The monkey is evil because Mrs. Coulter is evil. Still, Ozymandias, the nastiest piece of daimonic work seems to constitute his own measure of wickedness. The Book of Dust, written many years later, presents a frankly darker and even deceased side of diamonds that resonates more with the original readers of the first trilogy than with today's child audiences. La Belle Sauvage is concerned with Lyra's infancy, and introduces factors and people largely unknown in his dark materials. It lays the ground for events in the secret commonwealth, which happen when Lyra is 20. The end of the first trilogy 
brings an optimistic, although heartbreaking, ending to readers who are led to believe that Lyra's prophetic mission saved the world, or in any case, made it a better place. La Belle Sauvage shows how much was wrong with Lyra's world at the time of her birth and how inevitable were the revolutionary and seemingly heartless moves of Lord Asriel. The secret commonwealth, on the other hand, instead of displaying a reassuring image of Lyra enjoying the fruits of her selfless and noble deed, causes a shocking surprise and reveals that things not only did not improve, but got significantly worse. Lyra finds herself expulsed from her beloved Jordan College, the only home she ever knew. Terrible things began to happen globally, bringing an undetermined doom somehow connected to big pharma, geopolitical power struggle, and a massive refugee crisis. The disoriented readers must now trust Pullman's talent to convincingly resolve this convoluted puzzle in the still untitled last installment of the second trilogy. If they are disappointed, if they are disappointed, they may regret ever starting to read the Book of Dust. The main subject of the present analysis is to establish the place of diamonds in the natural order of things, according to Pullman. The diamond lore accumulates exponentially in the novel after the pregnant first words, Lyra and her diamond, telling us that diamonds are born and grow up with their people, with whom they are one and the same. Through the words of Serafina Pekala, a Scandinavian witch queen, the author explains the nature of diamonds to Lyra, saying, it's what makes us different from animals. A differencia specifica required only in a world where there are thinking and talking animals. Towards the end of the amber spyglass, when Lyra and Will stop the escape of dust from the world, Serafina Pekala talks to Lyra's and Will's diamonds, explaining what the children achieved and says, one thing hasn't changed. You must help your humans, not hinder them. You must help them and guide them and encourage them toward wisdom. That's what diamonds are for. The relationship between humans and their diamonds is of such a personal and intimate nature that it is forbidden to touch somebody else's diamond. It is considered an assault, and those who do it intend harm. Diamonds can touch each other if their humans are particularly friendly. Touching a diamond may also have a sexual connotation, whether in the sense of molestation and violence, the behavior of doctors performing intercision at Bolvangar, or intimacy between lovers, Lyra and Will in the amber glass. Unsettled diamonds can take the form of any animal, as the current mood, whim, or need dictates, although their gender always remains the same as at birth. At puberty, they settle as an animal that mirrors their human's personality occupation, or even social standing. An adult diamond offers to onlookers a symbolic insight into her, his person's character. Diamonds speak to their humans, to each other, if necessary, also to other humans. When people do not want to be overheard, they can communicate diamond to diamond. People and diamonds use the same human language even though Pullman does not explain how it is biologically possible for all these incredibly diverse fauna to produce human speech sounds. It is, of course, the writer's prerogative. His dark materials are not science fiction, where the rule of scientific likelihood and explanation prevails, but fantasy. 
Diamonds are mortal. Death for them means disintegration. When their humans die, they disappear in a puff of smoke. Humans leave their physical bodies and travel as ghostly copies to their afterlife, guided by another original lifelong companion, their death, who remains invisible when they are alive, but shows himself to them after they die and their diamonds disappear. These deaths bring their people to the shores of another world. We may call it the underworld, as it resembles the Greek Hades, complete with a ferry across a lake guarding the entrance to the land of the dead. Pullman does not reveal what happens to these immaterial beings once the dead embark on the ferry. Pullman treats personal death as entirely distinct and separate from the people they accompany and the people, the people's diamonds. The concept is stimulating and imaginative, but it is clearly only a pale reflection of the concept of diamonds, whom they, in a manner of speaking, replace, offering ghostly comfort to diamondless humans utterly alone for the first time in their life. Because the dead have no diamonds, there is no provision for their transport to the underworld. If quite exceptionally, living humans like Lyra and Will dare to board the ferry, their diamonds are not allowed to travel with them across the lake to the gates of the underworld. They must stay behind. Will's diamond, Kirjava, invisible until their separation, is also left there, and they both suffer the same desperate pain as Lyra and Pantalaimon. Only powerfully motivated and trained individuals can bear to be further than a short distance away from their diamonds. Witches, shamans, and exceptionally strong personalities like Mrs. Coulter may achieve separation combined with the ability to continue functioning normally. Lyra leaves Pantalaimon on the shores of the world of the living in the prophesied act of betrayal. Why this selfless action and heartbreaking sacrifice should be considered an act of betrayal is not obvious. Lyra does not want to abandon her diamond, but she must keep the promise given to Roger, for whose death she feels responsible. The fact that diamonds cannot enter the underworld comes as a cruel shock to both Lyra and Pantalaimon. Separating from her diamond causes Lyra the same suffering that he has to endure. How can it be called betrayal if he, being part of her, shares all her thoughts, cannot expect her to go back on her promise. It is the first sacrifice Lyra is forced to make, a prelude to the renunciation and heartbreaking loss of Will Parry. The mystical link with a diamond can be physically cut, like in the Oblation Board's intercision experiments, which severed kidnapping children from their diamonds and made the medical staff at Bolvangar compliant and indifferent to the horrors they were performing. The procedure also releases a great amount of energy, an indication of the strengths of the human diamond bond, enough to open a passage to alternate words, which was why the ruthless scientist explorer Lord Asriel separated Lyra's friend Roger from his diamond Salkilaya. <coughs> Adults seem to survive the cut and retain their diamonds as apathetic companions. Children and their diamonds who undergo intercision perish. Pullman's diamonds are also somewhat unexpectedly and without a hint of explanation a testimony to the unity of nature. Able from their infancy to change into any animal in its biologically correct form, they display affinity and connection to nature's genetic pool. 
even though such knowledge lies well beyond a child cognitive grasp. Diamonds transform into bona fide animal species, not imaginary creatures. Despite the biological correctness of animal species into which diamonds turn, animals react to them as they do to people. Curiously, one instance in the Book of Dust indicates that the unsettled diamonds can use their intuitive knowledge of animal biology imaginatively to create hybrids. Malcolm's diamond, Asta, is not afraid of experiments and changes into an owl with a duck's plumage to better deal with reduced visibility, owl, and excessive rain, duck. In Lyra's world, newborn diamonds get their names from the diamonds of the child's parents, who must be occasionally inspired by antiquity if they come up with Pantalaimon, Telemachus, or Stelmeria. Pantalaimon, the most important diamond in the trilogies, is usually called Pan by Lyra, which adds an intriguing note of potential mischief to the perception of this character. The animal world in Pullman's trilogies includes one sentient and talking animal species, the armored bear. The bears live in the north, in their own territory, Svalbard, have an organized society, a monarchy, rules of conduct, and values. They immediately detect untruth. Mm. They can talk and communicate with humans, cooperate and trade. They have no diamonds, but their armor takes on the symbolic role of their soul and identity. The Norse, where the Panzerbjörne thrive, is full of various unsentient animals. The northern fauna serves only as a background to the armored bear's story and situates them within that environment as living in harmony with nature. There is one less developed sentient animal in Lyra's world able to use a rudimentary speech, the Arctic fox, whom Pullman introduces to great effect as a narrative tool and comic relief. The fantastic nature in Lyra's world includes other marvelous sapient beings or creatures, angels, witches, prehistoric monsters like the cliff ghasts. In the world of the dead, a complex role is played by harpies, straight from Greek mythology, but with a twist. They are cruel and indiscriminate in their psychological torment of the dead, whom they prevent from leaving. But Lyra makes them relent, using their only redeeming feature, a passion for truth and authentic storytelling com combined with the profound and eternal misery of their existence. In parallel worlds, there are also strange beings, such as the Galivespians, who serve Lord Asriel as spies, miniature humanoids in size and personal pride, strongly reminiscent of the talking mice of Narnia and specifically of the valiant Ripichip. Chevalier Tyalis and Lady Salmachia, who went with Lyra and Will to the world of the dead, guess from the suffering they feel embarking on the ferry that they must have left on the shore their invisible diamonds. They appear to be the only sentient species apart from humans who are blessed with this kind of mysterious alter ego. The world of, of the Mulifa, a self-aware intelligent species living in synergy with strange wheel pod trees, has the grazer, placid cattle, and white feathered gigantic bird-like predators, Hualapai, whose purpose is not simply their own survival, but the destruction of the Mulifa 
and their habitats. They display a certain cunning and animal instincts, but there is no reason to consider them sentient beings. The Book of Dust in its first two volumes lifts the veil of secrecy and reveals what some readers already suspected, that apart from the villainous Ozymandias, there are many other less than cuddly diamonds in Lyra's world. The second trilogy tells us of psychopaths who harm their diamonds, of diamonds who quarrel with their people and abandon them, and who switch their allegiance to another human, of an international network of people deprived of their diamonds against their will who help each other survive of children whose parents sell their diamonds out of abject poverty or greed, of a lively black market procuring diamonds to wealthy clients, of separated diamonds who allegedly congregate in a rumored scary and remote place, and finally of faraway societies where members of the lowest class have no diamonds at all and are treated as pariahs. This diversity of failed relationship between people and their diamonds reflects the multiplicity of mentally unstable people, sociopaths, and human failures. This rather pessimistic image would have been out of place in the first trilogy, but is shown to the more mature readership of the Book of Dust without great reservations, although gradually. Several questions emerge from this recently revealed diversity. To what extent diamonds may exercise free will and independence from their humans? What makes them stay together and what causes separation? How can a diamond be a part of a person and hide things from them? A serious difference of beliefs between Lyra and Pantalaimon causes the diamond to leave. In her diamondless state, Lyra embarks on a dangerous journey to find Pantalaimon and understand what is happening to her and the world. Diamonds clearly possess some autonomy but the issue of Diamond's free will must remain a mystery until Pullman decides to make it a central part of one of his stories. Lyra's world is in many aspects similar to our own, but Diamond's come from Pullman's creative imagination and serve his narration needs. They do not have to remain within our logical boundaries. A general impression of Pullman's diamonds is one of evolution. From the wonder and delight produced by the concept in his dark materials to a devolution in the Book of Dust, which leads to a depressing and unexpected discovery of the concept's potential for suffering, horror, and evil. After a two decade long plumbing of the idea's depth, such progression appears natural enough. The dark side of the concept provides an astonishing lens for viewing human nature, or as Pullman would say, for grasping what it means to be a human being. <laughs>